You're listening to the Elephant in the Room property podcast, where the big things that never get talked about actually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and co-host of Fox Hills Location, Location, Location Australia. And I'm Chris Bates, financial planner, mortgage broker and wealth coach. And together, we're going to uncover who's really making the decisions when you buy a property. Please stick around for this week's Elephant Rider Bootcamp. And we have a cracking Dumbo of the Week coming up. Before we get started, everything we talk about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent. They will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances. Now let's get cracking. You know that we love to talk to people who can help us make a sense of property data and today we're going to be talking to one of the brightest young talents in property market commentary, Eliza Owen. Eliza is a residential property analyst at Domain, having previously been the commercial and construction analyst at CoreLogic. She's a bright young thing who holds a first class honours degree in economics from the University of Sydney and appears regularly on television, radio and has even presented on the TEDx stage. And in fact, her 2015 TEDx Youth Talk on property affordability is a doozy. In it, she passionately exhorts millennials to use Google to learn about economics. She also clearly explains what the median price is and when it's useful, why percentages can be misleading and why having equity in your home is so powerful. We'll include the link in the notes. Now, we don't really want to make this episode all about affordability, though. Chris and I were recently at a talk that Eliza gave where she explained the end of the property boom using insights we don't often hear of. She's smart, she's got access to great data and she knows how to explain complex things so they make sense to non-economists. Thank you for sharing more of the good stuff with us today. Thank you, Eliza. Thanks for having me. Hi, Eliza. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, You know, when we caught up, I was six, eight weeks ago at that kind of post-election kind of conference thing, um, you were already starting to see some signs of activity in the buyer market was increasing. But what have you seen over the last probably two months? Because we're kind of in the middle of July now. What what have you seen? Yeah, so I think... We do look to high frequency indicators to try and understand what was happening pre and post election. So when I saw you last, you would have seen the data that I presented that was looking at an average of um, check-ins for inspection of properties for sale um, prior to the election uh, versus check-ins after the election, uh, Mm. the week after. And what we saw was actually uh, an 18% jump in the number of people that were uh, using the platform HomePass, which is what um, agents use to check in people for inspection. So the number of people per property that were coming to inspection jumped 18% mm-hmm. the week after the election. And is that um, in Sydney? Or? That was in uh, New South Wales. Right. So we break that down by state. Mm-hmm. What was interesting, though, is that uh, there was only a 2% increase in people looking to get valuations on their homes for mm. sale. So there was this, I think, really strong um, sentiment among people who had been saving up um, during the property downturn in Sydney and Melbourne, waiting to see what was going to happen. And they're now sort of excited to participate in the market, whereas sellers might be um, a bit more cautious. (laughs) Um, Although we also, I've been tracking the new listings that get added to domain. Mm -hmm. And we did also see a jump in new listings um, across uh, Victoria, Queensland, um, a little less in in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Um, But there has been an increase in the volume of new listings post-election as well. Well, that's interesting. So there's pent-up demand both on buyer side and seller side, but the sellers are less enthusiastic because they're probably going to wait and see if prices rise a bit further, I gather. Yeah, exactly. I I think people that, you know, have been looking to sell aren't wanting to do so at at the bottom of the market. Mm. And you also mentioned there people seeking valuations. Um, So do you have access to, like, is that market appraisals you're talking about from agents? So, like, people considering selling, that first step is to go out and talk to agents, get market appraisals. Um, you can measure that. So I believe Domain also has a platform that um, measures the volume of valuations. Um, is that I, off, off the top of my head? I'm not yeah, exactly. Okay. I'm I can't guess, remember what the platform is called. Yeah, I'm sorry, but. guessing it's those agents who would press a button on Price Finder or for a um, automated 
uh, valuation to mm. include in their proposal. Okay, mm. yeah. But just on the home pass, um, you know, because it's interesting, I'm like flicking at properties right and then I add them to a kind of on a Saturday search. And even if I don't go and see it, sometimes it says I've viewed it and sometimes it says I've actually been to the property and like I feel like it knows what I've done. Can you tell me, <laughs> I guess, how like domain are doing that and then how deep the kind of domain going on that sort of data? Um, I probably can't speak to that, to be honest, yeah, because okay. I'm not a product person. Yeah. I'm, I sort of just sit quite independently in mm. a research and editorial space in the business. Yep. Um, but if you're not actually going to the property, but you're being told that you are, yeah. that's something that we probably need to look into. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to get a product person in here. Yeah. yeah. It's just, um, I find it interesting now because, you know, like real estate agents, let's say um, they've got multiple offices. Um, they'll be tracking you as a, you know, as a buyer and they'll start to put more credits on you. So if you go to three different properties, at three different agencies, like for example, Bell property would know that you've been to all these properties and they're starting to build this kind of data about you. And I think that domain are obviously doing that on buyers too, which is quite interesting because then you can start to pinpoint a lot more activity in the market rather than people just searching online, you can now actually get on the ground evidence. Well, we do have a lot of user insight data, but we need to make sure that people are protected in using our platforms mm. as well. So for example, when we look at check-ins per property, we're aggregating that at a state level. Mm. So um, there are layers of data that we don't really apply to one another Got you. Um, in order to you know, protect people's privacy and, and maintain trust with the consumer and things mm. like that. Um, but we do try and aggregate user activity to get insights. Mm -hmm. um, Domain Research House, which we started um, maybe t about 10 months ago, okay. um, we're just sort of scratching the surface with what we can do with Domain's user data. So some of the cool projects that I've gotten to work on this year, for example, was looking at where um, people in Sydney were inquiring for properties outside of Sydney. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. So I could see where people had sent buyer inquiries, um, a majority, or not the majority, but about 40% going to southeast Queensland, mm. for example, mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, a large portion of the rental inquiries were going from Sydney to Melbourne. Mm. So that <laughs> starts to supp supplement demographic data yeah. where we – look at these migration stats from the ABS and we say, oh, okay, people are, um, you know, leaving um, New South Wales persistently. Where are they going? So that layer of inquiry data might tell us about, oh, well, maybe they're buying an owner-occupier in southeast Queensland mm. and moving there for, uh, you know, affordability mm. or lifestyle or, or whatever. Yep. So um, there's lots of cool things that we're trying to do Um with, with that data. Wow. And and in terms of making sense of that, so like you say, you know, it could be affordability. I mean, we often, uh, well, all good research starts with a hypothesis, right? So you think, mm -hmm. okay, it's probably affordability, the reason that people are yeah. going up there. So then how do you then dig deeper into it to, to find out whether that's true or not or what mm. the nuances are within that? Well, I think we, we have various measures of affordability. So we look at things like the deposit hurdle. We look at yep. the ability of people to service mortgages once they've overcome the deposit hurdle. Um, I suppose in terms of intention to move, you would need to go um, more qualitative or maybe some kind of survey data um, to to get an understanding of the motivation. But even anecdotally, we hear of people that are sort of um, migrating to Southeast Queensland mm. because of the affordability mm. and, and the lifestyle. It's essentially uh, a 50% price discount on, on what you would see in Sydney, where your typical house is sitting uh, just over a million dollars, whereas in Brisbane, you might be looking at about 560,000. Mm -hmm. Or Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast, you're looking more at that 620,000 price point. And yep. so this is all about the human or the Australian dream of owning a home, that people will actually move states um, in order to achieve that. It's an interesting mindset thing, isn't it? And even in the city, you know, I've got a client, you know, who was, you know, all her friends are in Northern Beaches, you know, she's been in Northern Beaches, she's English, she's been living up there um, and they, she wants to move to kind of Cronulla so they can buy a home, you know, and it's complete other world. So, you know, leave the friends, leave what she knows, the community to move down there just so they can get home ownership, you know, and I guess it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty crazy, you know, that's how important it is 
for them to have a backyard and they're not going to sacrifice. So it's interesting how affordability kind of, you know, home ownership plays yeah. into our mindset so much. That's right. And I think that um, when you do look at survey data of renters, we've seen surveys produced which are showing um, people in rental situations are not as happy with their living situation mm -hmm. as those who are owner occupiers. We've got the HIA survey, which shows that over 90% of renters aspire to own a home one day. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think in terms of creating a sense of security in your tenure, mm. owner occupation is very important mm. where Australia still has relatively short-term rental leases mm -hmm. of that six to 12 month mark. Mm. Um, and, and so a home ownership provides the stability and also ownership is one of the pillars of retirement in Australia, mm. the way that it's been set up, the way that it's not means tested for your pension, the way that um, you alleviate your housing costs if you own a home by the time you're at retirement age. Um, and in terms of the wealth that's stored in the household as well, there's a paucity of data around how much people are accessing the wealth in their home. Mm. Oh, interesting, I know, yeah. Um, University of Tasmania, I think, are looking at starting up a project to understand how older people use equity in their home to fund things like retirement mm. and healthcare and things like that. Yeah. But the latest data we have, I think, is from um, Australian Her uh, Housing and Urban Research Institute, so mm -hmm. a hurry. Um, they produced some research in um, 2010 which suggested that about 18% of older Australians were using wealth in their home and health costs were a large aspect of that. Wow. Mm. And I think that's where, you know, when I've talked about young people and I've talked about affordability, um, I, whether it's investment or whether it's owner occupation, we have been set up to, in a way, kind of need to yeah. own a home mm. to, to achieve comfortable retirement. Mm. And if you've got people who are saying, well, just get over it, you're never going to own, okay, fine, but give me a stable renting solution. Yep. Give mm. me a different retirement solution mm. because you've set me up to fail, <laughs> yep. you know, by, by um, uh, I guess, not having more of an affordable housing strategy. It's, yeah, there's really interesting things here because you're absolutely right. I mean, retiring without owning your own home versus retiring with your own home, like, you know, apart from the fact that you've got a roof over your head that you don't have to pay for, assuming you've paid it off. Um, yes, there's all those other opportunities you have because of that equity. Um, but I guess that's part of the, you know, what's Paul Keating's vision with the superannuation, you know, in this country as well is to, to you know, systematically or systemically offer something different. Um, but however... <clears throat> Women in particular suffer through that because you've got to earn money in order to be able to contribute to that mm -hmm. or have your employer contribute to that. And, of course, if you take time out to have kids and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And so there's so many, uh, you know, things and issues mm. wrapped up in that. It's quite yeah. fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely. Superannuation, I think there was research that came out a few years ago showing that Australian superannuation was one of the least competitive in um, the OECD and mm -hmm. had relatively low returns. Um, in the way that it was set up and um, that the fees um, on on your super were one of the main factors mm. determining mm. how much of a return you get. Yeah. So we see that there's more review happening at the moment into the nature of superannuation, yeah. into the competitiveness. I think that's, uh, as, as you say, um, it seems like a really reasonable um, way to kind of protect people after they stop working. Mm -hmm. But we also need to make sure that that is a functioning solution and that it's competitive as well. And, yeah, the issue with, with women spending less time in the workforce because of childcare or caring for another dependent, yeah. that's yeah. something that we need to think about as well. And, and on that too, um, just regarding superannuation, because it comes back to property because, you know, it's not so much uh, prolific at the moment, but this, uh, this setting up yep. the self-managed super funds and the bit of a trend in the first decade of the, you know, the noughties, um, for everybody to think, I can't afford to buy an investment property, but I've got this money in my super and I can do it that way. And, of course, this proliferation of spruikers and mm -hmm. terrible advice. Mm -hmm. um, and quite often people have actually chewed through the balance that they had and ended yeah. up with nothing, all in this, you know, mistaken or misguided 
quest to own property. Mm. So it's an interesting, yeah, it's very multi layered, you know, multi layered. Um, yeah, the super and property discussion. You know, fortunately, it's probably going to end pretty soon. Well, there's not many um, banks lending on it anymore, are there? Yeah, there's pretty much all the banks have kind of pulled out of it. And, you know, the ones that were doing it, um, if you had an existing super loan, the fee, the interest have gone up much more than kind of normal residential rates. They're kind of really trying to get out of it. And, that you know, it might not be long before we see some legislation that completely bans borrowing within superannuation. So it's kind of been commoditized super. I think the, the mm. competitiveness of the fees, that's kind of ha- – um, kind of happening now because you know the big retail funds everyone's switching on after the royal commission and saying hang on a sec i probably should look at my super statement i probably shouldn't be at amp or mlc or you know big higher cost funds i can go to an industry fund and you know halve my fees so and i think switch so slowly but surely i think australians are kind of switching on to taking responsibility on their superannuation um as an economist um you know that every day kind of probably means something different to you but what are the days where you get kind of excited, excited when, you know, a piece of data is going to come out and you're like, refresh, refresh, refresh. Yeah. Um, well, yesterday there was building activity data. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the questions that I was concerned with, with the downturn of the property markets in Sydney and Melbourne was how necessary um, house price growth was to economic growth and jobs growth. Yep. So I sort of closely monitor building activity, uh, which we saw up to the March quarter yesterday, the biggest drop in apartment commencements um, in 35 years yep. occurred and mm. on that year on year basis. Um, however, that drop has occurred off of um, a, a sort of peak in building activity. Yes. So it's still sitting, you know, above a kind of long run average. So there's building activity data, um, jobs data. Um, a very important one for property analysts is catalogue number 5601 <laughs> from the ABS, um, which looks at the amount of finance that's going to households right. to mm. buy a property. Mm. Um, so I believe the um, May data comes out today at 1130. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is something that, is it, it's a leading indicator in that if we understand how much um, people have to pay for housing, mm. um, whether the level of finance is going up or down, it can be a, a leading indicator of about three to six months on um, property prices. But the problem is the data comes out at a two-month lag. Mm. Mm. Interesting. So that's where we start to say, okay, at Domain, where can we find more high-frequency Um, data releases. So we have um, Domain Loan Finder. um, We have a joint venture with uh, Lendy. So these sort of online um, loan finder solutions where we can actually, again, aggregate the data and get an understanding of Mm. what's happening in mortgage rates. um, And we want to get a view of of what's happening in, in sort of volumes as well. Um, So I was refreshing that the other day and we can see that the average mortgage rate among owner occupiers has come down and is sitting at about 3.6% yep. um, for July. That's principal and interest terms. Um, in the investor space, it's looking at about 3.9% at the <coughs> moment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, yeah, again, like a really cool piece of data that we yeah. have. Yeah. So that, that those, they're falling? Or, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so... Against what benchmark? Like that was the interest rates. Oh yeah, sorry, the mortgage rates. Um, oh, so sorry. we're looking at average. Yeah, you're thinking growth. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, right. So yeah. Um, yeah. we're looking at average um, mortgage rates. Oh, gotcha. Um, sorry. Yes. The the lending data that comes out from the ABS has generally shown uh, that finance is still falling. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what the next few months of mm. releases will mm. show us because that will be election month and then post election. You might be across it. So AFG is a big mortgage aggregator. Um, they're one of the biggest and they have some pretty cool reports around lending. So I know that, um, you know, when you're looking at where, how lending activity is going, it's good to have a big broad spectrum of brokers because you've got some brokers that will be growing their loan brook just because they're in a growth phase. And then you've got, and so AFG do provide some really interesting data around what's actually happening with their brokers and they've got thousands of brokers. So it's a really good kind of litmus test of what's happening. Yeah, um, awesome. 
I think, you know, a lot of people with lend, you know, with property, they say, oh, lending's going down, it's off a slow growth. But you're right, there's such a low lag and you've got to kind of break it up between owner occupiers and investors because they're both completely different stories, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any kind of know about what's kind of the data behind what's been happening with the investors versus owner occupiers? Well, I followed the data very closely when I started studying the housing market, mm. um, particularly as someone you know, I'm probably one of the few Australian property analysts who doesn't actually own property. <laughs> so I started. <laughs> Not even um, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. Is that because, I mean, you, are you Gen Y or a millennial? Yeah, millennial. She's a millennial. Yeah. You're a Gen Y, aren't you? Yes. Are you <laughs> so I'm, I'm the grand. The grandmama in here. I'm a Gen X. <laughs> oh, I, you know, I'm not I, a grandmother, by the way. <laughs> I, and, and and there's an element of it being that I'm young, but there was an element of it that when I started monitoring the housing market, yeah, 2013, 2014, mm. Sydney started uh, increasing by double digits. Yes, um, you know, growing them. Well, actually, yeah. over 20 in the areas in which you know I, I was operating, we, we're looking at 22, 24 percent. For random growth for a couple of years, it was just nuts. Which yeah. doesn't really give you the motivation to save for no. a deposit. It gives you the motivation to kind of throw up your hands and say, and go travel and <laughs> <Why> bother. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and, and you know, there's a lot in behavioural economics about that as well and how in uh, motivation is tied to, you know, the size of the, the goal that you're looking at. Mm. And, yeah. Um, so in terms of what was happening in the lending space, that was a, um, one of the first times in New South Wales that we actually saw... Um, money being lent to investors was exceeding the money being lent to owner occupiers, yeah. wow. which is quite a bizarre landscape yeah. because yeah. when you think of a property, you think of people buying somewhere to live. Yeah. Uh, in 2014, the investor lending eclipsed owner occupier lending uh, across New South Wales, and it suggested that more people were getting money to buy an investment than they were something to live in. Yeah. Then um, I think being concerned with rising levels of household debt and um, potentially risky lending, yep. the um, statutory authority APRA, um, Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, stepped in, um, in uh, toward the end of 2014 and limited growth in investment lending mm. to um, banks uh, by uh, 10% a year. So there was yep. a 10% cap on the growth that they could have in investment lending. Um, very um, quickly, the banks complied and uh, their investment lending is currently sitting around uh, 2% growth, even though that has since been repealed. It got repealed in 2018. The big one was um, in, uh, I think it was March 2017, they announced that by September that year, there would be a 30% cap on the portion of lending that could be on interest-only terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at the time, a majority of investors were seeking loans on interest-only terms. And yep. so, again, the the policy really did target the investor segment of the market. Yep. And when APRA um, kind of really put pressure and, and reduced the investment lending, that's when we started to see a, a rise in the portion of first home buyers participating right. in the market. Yep. It's also where we saw, you know, 15% decline <laughs> yep. in, in house mm. prices. Yep. So what I think is so interesting is that we, we refer to the housing market as if it operates in this kind of free market or this fundamental supply and demand. Mm. And to an extent, there are those fundamentals at play. Mm. But the amount of influence that institutional intervention yes. has had particularly in those high investment markets like Sydney and Melbourne, is just incredible to have observed. Yeah. Mm. And it's a lifelong lesson, I think, to take that the housing market doesn't operate in a vacuum. Institutions are reactionary. And if they see debt getting too high or if they see prices getting too high or if they see prices getting too low, mm. there are things that they can do and there are things that they have done. The 10% growth cap got repealed in uh, late 2018. The 30% cap on interest-only mm. lending was repealed in January 2019. Institutions aren't just sitting there watching it happen. They're really... Um, Playing with the levers. Yeah, they mm. are. They're trying to guide things. I, but the extent to which they can control prices, you know, I don't, I don't think they can control everything, but they certainly did catalyse the, the, the downswing in yep. the cycle. Um, so... 
Well, they definitely have a huge impact on uh, how much people can borrow and who they're going to lend money to and who they're not going to lend money to and at what percentages and what areas. And, you know, technically, you know, credit, if you can't borrow in an area or you're not create and people in that area haven't got the income and things like that, then, you know, they can control prices to a certain extent, you know, and, you know, they can basically, you know, a lot of banks will blacklist postcodes because they'll say, well, that's not too risky for us. So yes. they're actually affecting prices in that postcode. Yes. Well, I, I guess that is the, the bank being informed by their prudential um, duties where they're saying, okay, well, you know, is there too much risk in these areas? And mm. and that does come back to fundamentals of supply and demand, right? Yep. But but for sure, the, the institution guides a lot of, you know, e- even this morning, I think there was an announcement that NAB, ANZ and Westpac have had to have their capital requirements increased. Mm. Um, so that might inform some of their mm. lending policy um, later this year as well. So back to why you haven't bought. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we went off no, on no, a no, tangent This, this a bit, is really but... <laughs> interesting because you've got all this stuff going on and you as an economist could observe that from a, an academic or an informed position um, to say, well, this is not um, something I necessarily want to invest in because I can see that it's been controlled by, uh, you know, forces that are greater than we are all assuming maybe. Um, but at the same time, there was some crazy stuff happening, certainly when you when you first started researching it. And, and I agree, the market obviously overshot the mark. And, you know, you can see it's corrected and et cetera, et cetera. But is that something that you personally look at now and think, oh, I don't want to play in this? Or is it, do you think now that, um, well, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> so on the on the contrary, I, I sort of look at all this and I think, well, is housing too big to fail? Mm. Um, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, because it is our biggest <laughs> single investment class in it this country. It absolutely yeah, is. Yeah. Trillions mm. of dollars, yeah. several times the size of Australian GDP. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I'm i actually quite, I'm, I'm people who know me would know I'm not exactly like a, a liberal voter, but I'm actually yeah. quite inspired by the um, plans for the Greater Sydney Commission's three CBD yeah. city. Mm. Um, I, I think that's a really interesting vision. Um, if you look at areas that have city deals mm. where the federal, the state and the local governments are working together yeah. to create growth and prosperity for regions. So you've got cities like Launceston, um, which I think makes sense as an area of spillover from, mm. from Hobart, even though geographically it's not next to Hobart <laughs> or anything, but it's the next biggest city. Um, you've got the property council lobbying for a city deal in, uh, I think, Wollongong, um, and you've got a city deal on Western Sydney. Mm. So I think that's basically the government saying we're going to do what we can to ensure that there's infrastructure, there's jobs growth, um, and there's new uh, property development in these areas. Um whether they can pull it off, <laughs> yeah, and a how long question. will it take? And yeah, how yeah. long will mm. it take in in, in, um, your, in my lifetime? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I heard a really interesting anecdote about the Eritropolis and you know Badgerys Creek Airport, mm. um, and how you know they want to kind of build out this industrial area by the airport, but um, a concern is what I think it's called bat and bird strike. So they have to be conscious of vegetation yep. around the airport. Yeah. So uh, what, are you going to have a big industrial mountains. area in Western Sydney with no trees or, yep. you know, so all these oh, that's complexities. I know well, it's, it's right so near Blue Mountains, right? You don't, yeah. you don't want so birds flying into yes. aeroplane engines. Apparently it costs uh, airlines hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in the replacement of <laughs> engines. Not to mention... It's just phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Not to mention, the of danger. course, the environmental, <laughs> the danger, mm, the environmental mm, damage, the threat yeah. to biodiversity. So I, while I think um, government visions for cities are very important, um, and I think a lot of people do speculate on them, Yes, um, there are risks to how they can be implemented how long it takes to complete and, that. And Badgerys Creek is also a really good example because I can tell you that long before I bought my first property, and that is now well over 20 years ago, um, Badgerys Creek was on the radar as an airport site yep. and people were buying houses out there cheaper 
because they knew it was going to be under a flight path. Um, then they started complaining that they were going to cop all the noise. And I go, but hang on a minute, you got a discount when you bought out there. Um, and then it was off the table, and then it was back on and off the night. Yeah. You know, and and here we are. At, we're it's probably being I don't know the exact amount of when it first was tabled, but we, we you know talking about greenfield sites, that thing has been sort of on the books maybe for thirty years yes, now. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so people yeah. like you say, people speculate on yeah. these promises of infrastructure, and then and then. What is the impact? Because, yes, what is going to be developed around it? Is that really going to be a boon for prices or, or you know, create yep. jobs and wealth and all that sort of palaver or not? You know, yeah. I mean, and it's just all speculation. Well, I I think yes yes and no. I, I think that there are areas you can identify that have, um, you know, priority precincts that, yep. that are kind of prime for development that all show, also show a level of promise mm. and are affordable. So mm. I think the last time I, I saw you both, I, I talked about my bullishness around um, the kind of Bankstown area as yep. like an extension of the inner west, mm. um, kind of, you know, separated out by train lines and the Cooks River and things like that, which yep. has held, held them back, but um, sort of an interesting area. Um, but ultimately I think, you know, Sydney – as a, as a city, I'm quite confident in um, stability in, in housing. I don't think we're going to be seeing the kind of double-digit growth that we did in um, between 2013 and 2017. But I do think as um, an asset to have for my retirement or, you know, to, to pass on to another generation, uh, I, th- I still think it presents a, a good opportunity um, and I think the, um, you said the, you know, too big to fail <coughs> and, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, especially that was all over the news right in the, the bust, I guess, that prices were going to keep falling. We're going to see 40% drops, mm. you know, a lot of doomsdays out there in the market. Mm. Um, even the big economists out there, you know, say Shane Oliver thought 25%. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a lot of kind of hype around big downward prices, but the reality is the, it is too big to fail, right? It is our biggest asset class. It is every, most Australians' biggest asset. And it's most of, you know, the state governments with their stamp duty, the, you know, taxes on land release, you know, commercial developments, employment. Um, the reality is these things that are happening now, all the things to stabilise the market, were always going to happen. Um, is your belief that, you know, the government's always going to keep on trying to pump up prices because they're just so invested in <laughs> that? You are such a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I th- I think they probably will try to create long term um, steady growth. Whether they can, mm. I, I I don't know. Anything could happen, and there are risks of economic shock as well. Mm. Something that has aided the Australian economy, even in the housing downturn, is this kind of shift to infrastructure yep. and commercial development. Um, but even with the commercial development, a lot of that is based off of um, people looking for asset investment, people yeah. looking for growth. So there's an element of speculation in yeah, that as well, I think. But, um, yeah, I, I think they will do what they can because the way we are set up at the moment, housing is such an integral part of, of retirement. If nothing else, for me personally, I would – like the the feeling of owner occupation, the security that comes with that, um, the ability to kind of put down roots in in my city where I've grown up, um, and you know, as we were saying earlier, maybe it won't be the city where you grow up, or um, mm. but but clearly it's something that a lot of people still want. Yeah, yeah. it's funny because as prices go up, the you know affordability becomes a problem, right? And mm-hmm. that's the challenge. You push prices up, then it marginalises first home buyers. The double edged. They sword. get upset. Yep. Then they create a big voice that affects the government. They might lose, you know, might lose your re-election and things like that. And so that's what Gladys came in. We've got to fix housing affordability. Well, she didn't really do much. Um, she just waited for prices to correct with, you know, the cycle. Uh, and she said, oh, we'll just do congestion busting. We'll just spend money on infrastructure. Which which doesn't make sense either because I don't think I've ever seen a new train station go in and property prices go down. Yes. <laughs> you know, like that. that's kind of a counterintuitive um, it's uh, funny concept yeah. that, mm. that decentralization and infrastructure is going to bring prices down when, well, if that's the case, why do investors speculate in the land around it? Or mm. um, I think that's a very important myth. The, or maybe it evens it out a little bit, perhaps. 
You know, so if you've got it all concentrated in one area, it's just going to make one area completely unaffordable. You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not one for going outside the 10K radius. Yeah, so there, there, could, there, there actually could be something in that. I think the more stock you develop, the more, um, you know, people yeah. just choose Chooses. to live somewhere mm. else and, and you're creating more supply, which could put downward pressure. But if anything, I think the most in effective <laughs> policies that we've seen have come from taking that overinvestment and that over speculation mm. out of the market. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I and, agree. And, and I think within that, now I'm wondering what sort of the data that you see, you know, paints pictures around that because one of the things I've found really hard is that like with apartment data, for instance, and this is a classic, you've got all those apartment buildings that have been built for investor stock, full of investor stock, right, as opposed to investor grade or as opposed to being built for owner occupiers. And then you've got established existing apartment buildings in established suburbs where there's not a lot of land releases and yet all that data is lumped in together. Do you have insights or access to being able to pull that apart and really see the difference and how it all behaves? It's such a good question. And unfortunately, we uh, our market price analysis is based on sales data. Um, the sales data doesn't really give us an indication of the quality of the property. It doesn't give us an indication as to whether the property is new mm. or established. Mm. So it is very hard for us at the moment to separate out and do that kind of analysis. It yeah. would be very interesting to see. What I would say is that um, there aren't really suburbs and I, I might go out on a limb and say that there isn't really stock that escaped the dramatic cyclical movements that we saw in Sydney and Melbourne. So by the time we got to, um, you know, the market trough sort of around March, um, 80% of Sydney suburbs had experienced either no growth or a decline mm -hmm. in the typical yeah. purchase price. Yeah. And um, the other portion of suburbs that had seen growth had either fallen earlier or they're yet to, you know, experience a decline. So I, I don't think um, there are areas that escape the cycle, but but certainly there would be stock that is more impacted. Yeah. Magnitude. Yeah. And, and yeah. it does speak a lot to that investor grade kind of mm. apartment development. Um, it speaks to perhaps new development areas. You know, you look, we've seen a lot of fluctuation around Box Hill where yep. it's not really... Mm. Um, been fully established yet. It's very far from the CBD. And that is where your inner ring suburbs, your your nice established properties um, can be viewed as a good long-term investment. Yeah. But I think because of that, they became swept up in yes. the investment boom as well. Yeah. I look, I agree with you. I think there was an over-enthusiasm um, yeah. at, at, towards the end of the, um, the boom, for sure. I actually did some analysis um, on 50 properties that I'd found that uh -huh. had sold in the 18 months leading up to the end of the boom or the peak of the boom, and then it on-sold in the two years after that. And t because my initial hypothesis was like not everything loses money, uh, loses value in a market downturn. And, and I know that to be true, except that how do you prove it, you know, and at what proportion? So I, I looked into these properties thinking, and that was my hypothesis, I wanted to just show that there are certain examples and I figured you could pull it apart and explain why. But then what I really realised in looking at that data was that the timing, because real estate is a long-term play, and it really just reinforced that, that if you bought at the wrong time, it doesn't matter how good the asset was, you, and then you had to sell within a short period of time and it happened to be after the boom, it ended, then you pretty much were going to lose money regardless because of all, a combination of all those things. You're selling too quickly. It, you've bought at the wrong time. It, it doesn't sort of matter what you paid in a way because you know, obviously if you overpaid, you, your losses are going to be magnified, but um, it, that that's not the issue. And the, col and the quality of the property wasn't necessarily the issue either. It's the fact that you bought at precisely the wrong time and bought without thinking you might need to to on sell. But mm. having said that, I could see very clearly in this, and I'll put the, the link in the um, show notes, very clearly in, in that was that the boom had ended. I'm sorry, the, the market in Sydney, and I'm talking inner Sydney here, yeah. um, the market in inner Sydney had definitely bottomed out earlier than March this right. year. 
because the sales, the on sales in 2019, there was 33% that had actually sold for more than the purchase price. Ah. Whereas last year, in the entire year, only 14% had sold it at either the purchase price or more mm. than the purchase price. So that was clear that, um, and so that's that's a, and that's not time in the market per se, because if the market's still falling, those figures are not going to um, increase, are they? That's just showing that actually the, the market had turned. And that was before the election, really, because all mm. of those sales were for this year. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, diving into that, it's a really interesting that showed me something that I hadn't expected yeah. to learn from it. And and I think it's important to note as well, um, there are states and territories where they didn't have the same investment boom, yeah, so exactly. they don't mm. get the same bus. So yes. you've got Hobart prices, which are actually still going up. Um, you've got <laughs> South Australia, which is a very owner-occupier mm. kind of market. Yep. It's stayed very, like, slow and steady. Yeah. Um, which is and- what you want, isn't it, really? You oh, you want slow and steady. You you. You don't, well, maybe not slow, but you want steady. (laughs) Well, I I think there's, you know, a lot of debate to be had about whether housing should be as financialised as it is. But the case with Adelaide, particularly the house segment, Mm. is that it's just majority people live in the property that they buy. Mm. And you don't get the same kind of fluctuation, speculation. Yeah. Um, Yeah. so, and there's always a continuing kind of growing kind of demand there that's slow. You know, your kids turn 18, there's three kids, and they go out and they meet someone and, you know, they have a family and et cetera, and then they're another buyer to the pool and et cetera. So, you know, it's like, you know, there's not this kind well, of mass migration. Right. They have very steady population. Yeah, right, and it's well. just, but it's not like, you know, 100,000 moving there this year for a mining project, then yes. they're out again like yes. maybe in Perth. Yeah. Um, I think you, re- you made a really interesting point Um around the boom and the bust, how you said that 80% of the suburbs dropped, et cetera, and some hadn't. That's the reality here. Even if, you know, the, the boom has ended, it's only ended in some pockets and it's only ended in some types of assets, mm. um, you know, because even in those suburbs, I, think, I reckon apartments probably still haven't got that same drive because a lot of the people who are buying the apartments say investors aren't really back in the market in full swing. And a lot of first home buyers that were thinking apartments are now thinking houses because they can get a house. And so, you know, even this this coming out of this kind of downturn, we may see that in kind of the inner premium suburbs for houses, but we might not see it in the middle ring. We, we I don't think we'll see it in the outer ring. I don't think we'll see it in high supply investor markets. You know, I think there's going to be a, a bigger lag and maybe potentially still quite big falls to come. Well, we've done a lot of work on the dynamics of housing market cycles mm. um, in, in cities and what we typically find is that Sydney and Melbourne have the high end. Uh, so the higher price points lead the market in terms of um, th- those upswings and, and downswings. Mm. Uh, and then we find that the lower price segments tend to follow. Mm. So I, I think the problem is when you look at a snapshot of data and you're like, oh, Mossman prices are going back up. And um, yeah. that means that Mossman is a blue chip suburb that will yep. always go up. <laughs> yeah. No, actually our analysis has showed that the high end of the market is more volatile, yep. higher highs and lower lows. You need to look at the data in a kind of fluid time series yeah. way. Yep. And Mossman might be up at that point because it was down, you know, 20%. I, yep. That's not an uh, actual, that's just no, like a yeah. hypothetical yeah. example. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, people in Mossman. Um <laughs> So, you know, it's, 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 it's things like that where I think at some point over the past five years, mm. suburbs would have experienced, a you know, their upswing and, and downswing. It doesn't mm. all happen at once. What we do with our, um, what, it, what we call our stratified median series is we stratify the cities into value groups mm. and we get a sense of how each group is performing. And we take an average of, of the growth rates and try and apply that to one mm. price. So when we refer to that series, we're trying to capture, you know, broadly movements in the whole market. Yep. But it, it will be different depending on when you're looking at your mm-hmm. snapshot of data. It's really interesting. We interviewed Frank Gelber uh, back in episode 37, 37. Um, so he's, uh, he describes himself as a forecaster, property forecaster with a a long memory because he's been doing it for 30-odd years. Yeah. And, and he talked about the high end of the market, you know, 
Oh, in long term, actually outperforms everything else uh, percentage wise, but also that they can triple and then they can halve. Yeah. Um, so yes, that volatility, you yes. know, is is. Um, yes. And so yes, when you've got a suburb like Mossman, we've got a fair amount of homogenous, homogenous stock as well in in many regards. You know, lots of big family homes on you know large blocks mm. of land, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, of course, that's you know yes. in relation to the rest of Sydney, that's very much high end as well. So mm. you, you've got that all those things. Um, that's a very there. good point. And uh, so my colleague Trent Wiltshire, he actually did uh, an analysis on volatility in the different price segments across the city. Yep. He found in Sydney and Melbourne, the high end of the market is more volatile. 100%. Um, yeah. But then in areas like Perth and Adelaide, where, again, you have that uniformity of stock generally, um, the the um, price segments have a similar kind of level of volatility. Mm. So um, It makes sense though, you know, like especially – you know, if you're going to take out huge mortgages or you're going to put a lot into an asset, um, playing the cycle is going to be a lot more important to you, right? Because you're talking big numbers and business confidence comes in a lot to it. You know, if you're thinking about big price falls in, in Sydney, you're not going to go out and confidently go buy something at $5 million if, you know, that potentially you could pick it up next year for 4.5 or, you know, economic cycles play into that market a lot more with because, you know, you got a bigger proportion in, in business owners and in other investments. You know, if other investments are doing well, etc., they take more risk. So it makes sense yeah, that it does. It, but except on the on the high side of that, it's all the buyer behaviour. It's all you know. It's back to the elephant. It's like they all feel overconfident and they're splashing yeah. out the big bucks. You know, so then triple in prices. It's like well, the same brain is not actually engaged. <laughs> we're making all those decisions. You know, it's yeah, phenomenal, yeah, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's counterintuitive because you should be out. Pl- you know, going against the market and it should yeah. create, um, you know, cu- counteract the volatility. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned around uh, construction and how it's coming off from a very high, you know, completion and application and approval, you know, and, and construction has multiple different levels to it, right? There's approvals, there's getting built, there's completed. Um, how do you think that's kind of going to play out over the next few years? And can you explain how there's a different elements to construction as well. It's not just all these apartments. There's, you know, joint dwellings and new dwellings, et cetera. Yep. So um, when we look at the commencement data, for example, that's talking about, uh, so the building activity data set has commencement um, and completion data. Um, And what we saw was at the apartment level, there was this peak of, um, you know, about 29,000 commencements of new units across Australia. Mm. So that's not taking into account demolition, which we might factor in at about a 10 to 20% rate, right? Because you're taking away stock to deliver new Mm. stock. Um, Now that uh, came down to March at about, um, to about 17,000 commencements, I I think Mm. it was over the quarter, but the long run average is 12,000. Wow. So Mm. there's still very high levels of construction going on. Yep. In the house segment, we didn't see the same um, kind of ramp up of construction. So housing, um, house commencements have stayed fairly yep. steady over exactly. time. Yep. Um, they have come down a little, about 9% um, year on year. Um, so yeah, there's different sort of um, dynamics, I guess, depending on the, the kind of stock it is. Yeah, I think because it's really interesting for people to kind of, they think that, um, oh, the construction boom's over and things like that. Well, no, there's actually still quite a lot of cranes out there. There's mm. still a lot of people still having to build these apartments. And, you know, I can't, and there's still, you know, we've got the highest crane count kind of going around. So there's still all these apartments to come. But, you know, I don't think people realise that, you know, there's so much still in the pipeline that's still getting built, that's still being approved. It's got to get finished still, as well. That stuff yeah. that's, that started. Mm. There's, um, you know, I, I think there's a bit of a crisis maybe looming here because there's a confidence crisis now that we've had, you know, Opal Towers and then Mascot Towers and now you've got this other building that was in the Herald this, you know, this week, as I said, um, these episodes, as you all know, if you've been listening, we record them and then we may not release them immediately. So this is in July. Uh, I think the, what date is it today? See, on the 10th of July, mm. there was, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald released a um, an article about a property, a building in Zetland that had been evacuated late last year and kept quiet. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think we're just scratching the, the 
tip of the iceberg is. Am I mixing my metaphors? Yeah. And and how is that going to feed into into consumer confidence in buying new stock? Is what is what I'm alluding to here? Yeah, I think that will definitely feed into confidence. There was um, a great op-ed um, that was someone writing my advice about buying new apartments. Don't. Yeah, um, that's pretty much what we've said for years. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's a frightening prospect that mm. the mortgage could outlive the structural integrity of the building. Yeah. So, mm. and and but, oh, and not only that, the value you might have paid um, too much. So even before that happened, the, it may, you may not have actually recovered what you paid for mm. it. And then you got the mortgage, and then the building starts falling apart. Yeah. Again, I think there is a bit of a black box around it. We know that there are some really good developers. We know there are some not so good developers. Mm. It would be great to. Um, and I know there are some organisations out there that collect data on the materials used in buildings mm. and, and development projects and things like that. Um, so I think it would be just good to have a view of it because mm. at the moment we really don't understand the extent of the, the problem. Yeah. Um, but I think I think it would feed into um, confidence around buying new developments. Um, and again, the developers will be reactionary going out of their way to kind of prove the integrity of these buildings and, you know, showcasing the processes that they're putting in place to make sure that their buildings are safe and, and Which stable. Probably a good thing, really, because Absolutely. it's all hidden. Absolutely. You know, once the thing's built, no one's actually seen the fabric of it. And, and yeah, so, you know, I think mm. fundamentally moving forward, this is, I'm glad this has come to a head. It's yes. just a real shame. There's a lot of people that are being going to be devastated financially, you know, because and of And even the people that have already been displaced, mm. like, you know, it, it, it's Yeah, where are they living? And who's yeah. paying their mortgage? How are they paying their mortgage? And yeah. yeah, it's terrible. And it's not just, I mean, we are obviously very anti-new on this podcast just generally, and we do prefer kind of more established kind of older properties that you're getting your money in land and many other reasons, which I'm sure our listeners know. But we're actually starting, you know, in, in, in older buildings – they're not without their problems and you still need mm. to be extremely careful when you're buying older buildings because, you know, there are rust, there are concrete cancer, there are windows, there are, yeah. you know, substance, you know, there is so many problems with older buildings. And I'm sure Veronica's got lots of horrid stories over the years from where she's gone and looked at a beautiful apartment in Potts Point and, you know, looked at it and gone, actually, you know, there's some few things wrong here. Yeah, I think transparency is going to help everybody in, on both sides. So, you know, we've done, uh, we interviewed uh, Amanda Farmer and uh, f- a while back in the 30s, I think, and uh, and Rena Van Aus, who's a strata manager, and we talked about, and even uh, Michael Ferrier from ION, we talked about what goes into a strata report um, and really the lack of consistency, the lack of, um, of, uh, what's the word? There's there's, there's no real um, criteria, you know, in terms of um, what they have to adhere to and the lack of basic record keeping skills in many cases with strata managers. So therefore you've got um, you, often people buying strata properties completely in the dark and they think that they've done the right thing in terms of their due diligence, but they don't, they don't know what the holes are in that report. So then when you're buying established, obviously there's risks there. There's risks buying any property right? Yeah. So all about risk minimisation. And so that's so transparency in the strata report side of things and, and having a situation where you can't allow um, owners corporations to decide to to put a mute on things that are wrong with the building because they don't want to impact on the values. And that's a deliberate decision that is, is made at times. Um, that is going to help that side of things. And on the flip side, then you've got new and transparency in terms of what goes into that building being made and the certification processes and all that sort of stuff, that's got to help confidence as well. And I think that let's let's get out there and champion yeah. this. Anyway, we've taken this podcast is it, in a, <laughs> yeah. a different direction. Every week we hear incredible stories of the dumb things property buyers do, dumb things that end up costing a whole lot of money and or creating a whole lot of stress, mistakes that can be avoided. Please, Eliza, can you give us an example of a property dumbo? We can all learn what not to do from these stories. Oh, well, actually, speaking of, I, I guess, getting strata reports and, and history on the buildings, um, I had an acquaintance who, you know, first home buyer, actually employing the rent vesta strategy, yep. who um, bought an apartment and couldn't find anyone to rent it for about Three months, mm. so couldn't get that income to help pay off the mortgage. Um, a whole bunch of 
bad luck sort of um, occurred where they were made redundant and um, and the the building needed an upgrade of uh, the lift, which yeah. came to about twenty four thousand dollars. So that person really got into a lot of trouble. Mm. And I hesitate to call them a dumbo because I think there's a level of miseducation, 100%. perhaps lack of transparency, mm. transparency, um, and you know the kind of more fragile state of the economy. So um, they they just had a lot of really bad luck, I mm, think. Yeah. And it does speak to the necessity of, you know, really trying to do the research on the property if you can. Yeah. Um, and It's also knowing like, what to look for though, isn't it? That's the problem. It's yeah. like you think, I said, that's the problem with these strata reports is that people think they've done it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I really, so the property jumbo thing can sometimes be a bit uh, misunderstood that we're trying to kind of take, you know, make fun of people that have no. made mistakes. And all it's the not. Sa- all the whop, whop sound effects. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're trying to learn it's from not, the mistakes. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and the reality is, is that, you know, Aussie barbecue, right? You, you know, people don't go there and, you know, they'll talk about their good decisions. They'll talk about how yes. much money they're making in property. But someone's not going to go, hey, mate, I just lost 150 grand on a property. You know, the bad stories just don't get spoken about mm, because yeah. they're not nice to hear about. That person doesn't really want to think about that. They're stressed about it. They've gone through so much pain. And there's all these people that have, with property, that have lost that, you know, that that's not in the magazine. You know, mm-hmm. you don't see the no. person who, you know, the person, it's like, you know, 7.30 or ABC will call me and, you know, and you I know mm. and, and say, have you got an, a case study that, you know, has been done by off the plan? And people don't want to talk about it, Right. <laughs> And so what we're trying to do with this segment and this podcast is just kind of get these conversations out because there are people like that that, you know, went in blind, um, mm. might have been society pressures, mm. colleagues, family, yep. um, and just gone and thought, I, I'm not successful if I don't own a property. I can't buy a home because it's too expensive. I, there's this cool investment strategy called rent vesting that's all over everywhere, which mm. it was. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. I'll go and buy something. It can't be that hard. Yeah. Um, and they've gone and just done it and they've tried to do something for their financial future and they and they've just made a huge mistake and that's it's a very common thing that we we try to talk mm. about on here because you know there probably would have been things that that person could have done to protect you know maybe bought a better asset maybe you know a different type of asset in a different location you know maybe have done could more have due diligence to a few of our episodes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i think something that is so interesting about the nature of the investment boom is when you have so many in- investors it's like Safety. do you have that well but also do you have that many tenants that are yeah. out there and we've actually observed the rental vacancy rate mm. has has oh yes it's gone, gone up, up considerably. In, in sydney and melbourne mm. and you know and people as a tenant i can tell you that um, people aren't necessarily taking up new properties to minimise their housing costs. They might be getting more people into a share house. Yeah. You know, you might consolidation of tenants and how mm. that affects vacancy as well. Yeah, so, that, and that's a very interesting point that, yeah, you keep building more investment stock, investor stock, and it's like where are the tenants going to come from? Mm-hmm. And and there's been some impact and interesting, look, we've got to wrap this up in a minute, but sure. – but, um, I imagine that you've. Have, do you see a bit of migratory data around Sydney, for instance? Because at the eastern suburbs, um, property managers have been saying to me, "Look, you know, Zetland and Mascot and all of that sort of stuff. We never really thought that you know a, a tenant from Bondi, for argument's sake, might go on rent there. Except that when they're offered something brand new and it's really cheap rent, and they will go there for a little while until the building gets a bit shabby, and then they'll they'll probably head back to where they wanted to live in the first place. So. It's not actually it, the the boundaries in terms of uh, how it, where it's impacting uh, seem to be extending. So, what are you seeing in the data on that? Well, I've mapped out kind of typical days on market for um, rental properties across yeah. Sydney. Um, I did actually see um, non-renting areas being the most uh, affected by the increase in uh, stock. So non-traditional areas basically being the the northwest, mm. um, which is sort of more owner occupier, young family, um, right. suburbia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so whereas areas like um, the northern beaches, the eastern suburb, they've um, even the inner west and Balmain Peninsula, that sort of area, um, it's maintained a pretty tight. Uh, level of days on market on average over the last year, mm. um, looking at about 20, 22 days and, and under. Yep. Um, so, 
feet. Interesting yeah. stat to look at, actually, isn't it? Mm. Because, you know, you can look at, you know, you know, a lot of people go, I'm thinking about buying an investment, and then they'll say, what can I rent it for? And then they will look on, they'll look at, oh, there's three examples of properties that are renting for $700 a week. I'll get $700 a week. Well, just oh, because I don't even on, think they do that. What well, they do, they go and look at the property. The agent says, you'll get $700 a week for this. <laughs> and they go, okay. And they work true. out their yield on that. That's true. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think mm. that's probably is true. Now, Very they, rarely do they get online and have a look. I, if, I can guarantee that. Yeah, but if they do get online, you know, just because something's advertised as $700 a week rent, there might be $700 Doesn't mean it actually for rented for that either. $700 a week rent. And, you know, naturally when you're already thinking about buying something, you look for the good stories. You don't look for the worst case. Um, and if you do kind of look online and you see, actually, that one's actually pretty much the same as mine. And it's for six fifty a week, and it's still for rent, and they haven't rented it, and it's been on the market for fourteen days or forty eight days. You can start to kind of dig deeper because you've got when you're buying an investment, you know, getting a tenant and getting a stable rental in a fast time is one of the biggest risks mm. that you need to make sure you manage. And I don't think a lot of investors really do enough due diligence around that. They're just like, oh, it'll be right, mate. There's always people out there, but unfortunately, supply doesn't work like that. So. Yeah, especially when you. You, like you said, the northwest of Sydney, there's so many people saying, "Oh, oh, you got to rent, you got to buy an investment out there because there's a train line now." Yeah, you know, so <laughs> it's like, and then all these apartments. It's yeah. like, well, people out there aren't used to living in apartments; they're actually used to living in houses, and and they don't suddenly just start to, you know, move into apartments next to the train station. It's, it doesn't and, work and that again, way. And again, the speculation around those stations, I think those apartments are priced similarly to what you'd get for an apartment in towards the city or a house. Mm. It's quite, you know, it's quite bizarre. Um, And maybe it's something that will take off apartments in Castle Hill. I I, I, I grew up in Castle Hill, so I never thought I'd see that. (laughs) um, Home bias. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting point actually, because, you know, I know we've got to wrap it up here, but, you know, a client's trying to buy at the moment and, um, you know, come to me and, uh, you know, from Sutherland Shire and got a house down there, knows it, you know, grow up there, you know, he's lived there his whole life. He and, wants to leave. Um, That's really unusual. No, no, no. He's got a house. He's happy in his house. <laughs> got very low debt. Um, loves it, right? <laughs> but, you know, and has he's thinking about getting an investment property and um, they know they're not going to, shouldn't buy new. So they've gone, we don't want to go into too much debt. We want to buy an apartment and we'll buy an old apartment. We'll buy near a train station somewhere down there. Um, and the reality is, is that, you know, it's just not going to get you the returns because, you know, A, you know, the people renting there, renting there because of affordability, there's so many more apartments mm. going to get built between the Sutherland Shire and the city where the jobs are. And the reality is people with a buyer demographic to, to buy an apartment down there, you know, it's not until all the houses really become unaffordable that you would then, uh, aspirational high income families would want to live in an apartment. So, you know, you've just got to be extremely careful when you're investing in apartments in the outer rings because of the rental problems, because of growth, et cetera, like that. So mm. I love that little point. So thank you so much for coming in today. It's been, I loved it. That's yeah, been awesome. great. Likewise, like, I mean, I just think of a whole bunch of other topics I want to interview you on. <laughs> so we'll have to get <laughs> you back. so much fun. I'd love to come back. Thank you. Thank you. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... Let's talk a bit about the importance of owner-occupier appeal when you're looking at buying a property, Um, but also then the flip side of this. And and we did touch on this in this conversation with Eliza on a a few points. So first of all, if you're looking at sustainable, ongoing capital growth, you need to look at a property that has owner-occupier appeal and ideally from more than one type of owner-occupier. So that's really important because owner-occupiers tend to push up prices and also, as we discussed here, here, they provide the foundations of uh, a market. So the sustainability of a market comes down to really how many owner occupiers want to live there. But there's a there's a little kicker in this because as Eliza also mentioned, um, like with rentals, for instance, there are areas, there are areas that have got too many owner occupiers. And if you're going to look at buying there as an investor, you would be doing yourself out of probably some growth because you look at Adelaide, she said slow and steady, for instance, um, or and you'd be doing yourself out of some rental income, as she was talking about northwest of um, Sydney, where it's highly owner occupier uh, demographic there. So this is important because when you're choosing a location to invest in, you need to make sure that predominantly there are owner occupiers there. And I would say 
70% is the rule, really. So 30% investors, 70% owner occupiers is the ideal, right? You need to have enough in, investors there or renters, probably be, you know, wind it back a bit. You need to have enough people want to rent there to warrant uh, having 30% uh, of housing stock go to investors. But then in order to actually buy a property that is going to continue to go up in value at a, at a good rate, you want to make sure that it appeals to owner occupiers. But it is really important in terms of choosing an asset to always have in mind that owner occupiers need to want to live in this house, need to want to buy this house or apartment um, in order for you to be able to be confident that you've got a good asset that will go up in value over time. Join us for our next episode when we interview a property mentor, Justine Bennett. Now, Justine has vast experience in renovating properties, in particular strata properties. Now, it's a very complex world you enter when you decide you want to renovate an apartment. There's so many logistics to deal with. There are so many different levels of approval you have to worry about. It's not as simple as just putting a bathroom where you want it to be. You have to look at what's existing in the building and working logistically and physically with what's already there. We also talk about a lot of the things that you need to consider before you buy a property if you're thinking about renovating an apartment and also some of the pitfalls and things to be very, very wary of. Don't forget we're on all the social channels. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter. Or you can connect with us on theelephantintheroom.com.au. The links are all there for you. Please connect and send us a message. We'd love to hear from you. The Elephant in the Room property podcast is recorded at the Sydney Sound Brewery. This week's podcast was recorded by John Resk, editorial by Gordy Fletcher. Until next week, don't be a dumbo. Now remember, everything we talked about on this podcast is general in nature and should never be considered to be personal financial advice. If you're looking to get advice, please seek the help of a licensed financial advisor or buyer's agent who will tailor and document their advice to your personal circumstances with a statement of advice.